Today, uh, appropriately, we're going to be talking about Exodus being delivered from bondage. It's always good when we go through these days to you know hit the remembrance of why we do them as well. So we're going to start in Exodus 23, just verse 14 and 15 here. Three times a year you shall keep a feast unto me, and you shall keep the feast of unleavened bread. You shall eat unleavened bread seven days as I commanded in the time appointed in the month of Eve, for in it you came out from Egypt, and none shall appear before me empty. So that's what we're doing. We're here. We're observing the Feast of Unleavened Bread, appearing before the Lord. And where two or three are gathered there, he is also in the And in Exodus 12, 17 and 18, we read, You shall observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for in the selfsame day I brought your armies out of the land of Egypt. Therefore shall you observe this day in your generations by an ordinance forever. In the first month, on the fourteenth day of the month at even, you shall eat unleavened bread until the one and twentieth day of the month at even. So, seven days there shall be no leaven found in your, ho in your house. So the, the Hebrew word there is seor, which is a fermented type of leavening. Now, get, mind you, that's the only way they leavened stuff, really, back then. So um, today, you have a wider variety of leavening um, that permeates our food, if you will. So it, it continues, it says, For whosoever is eating that which is leaven, that soul shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he be a stranger or born in the land, you shall eat nothing that's leavened, in all your habitations, you shall eat unleavened bread or matzo. Okay. There's some Bible definitions for you. Seor, it's a souring, again, fermenting. And there's hametz, again, pungent, souring taste. And then uh, matzah. If I went, just tell me, I'll back that up for you here. It's 7603 for Seor, 2557 for Achmetz, and uh, for Matzah, 4682, which is the sweet bread. Okay. In the Greek, you also got uh, word challenges there, so it's good to hit on to those two. You got zume, which is to ferment, to boil, as in boiling up. That's what happens with fermentation. Usually something like sugars or alcohol will create bubbles, which causes it to rise. And then we have azumos, right? Unleavened bread, a zumos. Zumos would be leaven. But then you also have the presence of artos, which is just bread. It could be unleavened or leavened. So for this reason, a lot of folks end up eating leavened bread with their Passover, and I don't believe that they should be doing that. And one of the reasons, too, is also, if you notice, Artos, art one of the places it's used, it talks about the showbread, right? And we know the showbread was without leaven. As a matter of fact, no sacrifice had leaven in it, right? Except for the uh, Pentecost loaves, right? The bread that the Lord broke. Yeah, that's where I was going, was Artos bread, but... Again, unleavened. So when Israel was leaving Egypt, they didn't have time for the yeast to rise. And you know that story well. In their dough, yeast has a decaying effect. And therefore, Bible, the Bible uses that as a metaphor for sin, because sin has a decaying effect as well. And that's what happens through fermentation, right? So the picture of searching your house for yeast, as we talked about on Sabbath, is a great analogy for us to search for our life for any hidden sin. Why do you think that's important? And again, you know, I've talked to many folks in the church and they are dead set that they will continue in sin all the days of their life. And why would we have this exercise if it was not possible to put out sin? Think about it. Israel was to take the yeast and rid it from their midst in the same way we should rid our lives of sin, removing it from our life just like they did the yeast. Okay? So, you know that passage that talks about a, a, the woman put a little leaven in, inside the, the dough and it 
rapidly permeates the rest of the dough, right? And that's what that's what leaven does. And, and, and in our analogy today, sin being leaven, sin does the same thing. Sin grows relentlessly. If you leave it unchecked, it just continues to go, whether in your body or in the body. And that's why they have God created um, ways to disfellowship folks out of the body, not because out of a spite or a hatred, but to cut off that part of the body that could cause problems for the rest of the body until that part could be made whole and then be brought back in. Sin spreads insidiously. You know, through one man sin into the world, and through sin death spread to all men, right? We know that from Romans 5. And we know the sin of pride puffs us up. We read in uh, 1 Timothy that a candidate for the ministry shouldn't be a novice, lest being puffed up with pride they fall into the same condemnation as the devil. That's a pretty bad place to be, right? The same condemnation as the devil. Let's, uh, let's read 1 Corinthians Chapter 5, it says, It is reported commonly that there are there is fornication among you. He's writing to the church in Corinth, right? That there's fornication among you, and such fornication as is not so much as even named among the Gentiles, that one should have his father's wife. And you're puffed up, and have not rather mourned, that the he that has done this deed might be taken away from among you. For I verily, as absent in the body, but present in spirit, have judged already as though I were present concerning him that has so done this deed. In the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, when you're gathered together, and my spirit with the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, to deliver such a one unto Satan for the destruction of the flesh, that the spirit may be saved in the, door, in the day of the Lord Jesus. So why do you think they, he would want them to cut off sin if everyone in the body was expected to continue sinning all their days. Why would they just pick on this one guy for doing his sin? Think about it. Because I'm going to challenge I mean, I know my audience is pretty much familiar with uh, what I believe is the biblical stance on sin, but there's going to be people listening to the recording who may not, because I know every time I preach it, I get, I get people who are, because they, they judge it by their own experience. Well, I'm still sinning, so therefore... If I agree, mentally agree to that, that means that I, I'm not in a good standing with the Lord and I have to repent and all. And then they'll turn it around on me and they'll say, well, when's the last time you sin? Okay. I am not your measurement stick. Jesus Christ is. All right. And the Word of God, which we're reading together, and you, you will see and you will continue to see, sin is not only in the body. It's represented by leaven during this week. But it's meant for us for all time in regards to sin. So, he gives us this, Paul continues with this illustration. He says, your glorying is not good. Know you not that a little leavens the whole lump. Man, it's affecting all of you. Remember when uh, Aiken's tent, remember when he took those objects and he hit them? And all, everyone is going to be cursed if in, that, in the congregation if they don't you know, do something about that, right? A little leaven leavens the whole lump. So there's to purge out the old leaven that you may be a new lump as you are unleavened. For even Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. Here again, Paul reiterating that the old has passed and the new has come, and Jesus is the Passover, was foreshadowed and represented by the Lamb, but Christ is the fulfillment of that. He says, let us therefore keep the feast, not with the old leaven, neither with the leaven of malice and wickedness, but with the unleavened bread of sincerity and truth. Leavening has often been seen as altering the spirit of the bread if you will. It changes that bread's natural character and quality from a small lump with some weight and substance to a bread pretending to be three or four times its size. Made up pockets of nothingness, no, it's mostly air. That's the way we could be if we become puffed up in pride. 
Paul clearly states that leaven symbolizes sin, or in this case, he even specifies malice and wickedness. That souring effect, again, depicted by the Seor and the Hametz. That's what sin does to us. On the other hand, as I said, the unleavened bread, matzah, which just means sweet, is the sweet bread because it's not soured. It's not sweet as in sugary, sweet as in unsoured, depicts the life of sincerity and truth that Paul's talking about an honest-to-goodness way of living in the Spirit. Let's turn you back into Exodus. I want to show you how personally God is concerned with this. In Exodus 3, starting in verse 6 and 7, says, moreover, he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face, for he was afraid to look upon God. And the Lord said, I have surely seen the affliction of my people which are in Egypt, and I have heard their cry by reason of their taskmasters, for I know their sorrows. I have heard my, the cry of my people. Again, personal. He is personally involved here. Remember how we're likening that bondage to sin and realize that he's heard your cry by reason of your taskmasters, whatever those may be. And he says, and I have come down to deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians, the taskmasters. Deliver them out of the hands of the Egyptians. And to bring them up out of that land into a good land, and a large unto a land flowing with milk and honey, unto the place of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites. Now therefore, behold, the cry of the children of Israel has come up unto me, and I have also seen the oppression wherewith the Egyptians oppressed them. Very personal. Go to Exodus 13.3. And Moses said unto the people, Remember this day in which you came out from Egypt, out of the house of bondage, for by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out of this place. There shall no leavened bread be eaten. This day came you out in the month of the Abib. So you've got a, a colon punctuation mark in here after this place. It brought you out of this place. It's directly pointing to, usually when you have a colon, it it indicates that what follows this is going to be either a list or an explanation of what precedes the colon. Okay? And he says, this is directly pointing to, for this, by the strength of the hand of the Lord brought you out. And the explanation is, you shall not eat unleavened bread. You shall not eat leavened bread. So it points to the reason that we eat it. It's because what the Lord did for us. Of course, we're going to see as we go that we do have a part in this. It's not just the Lord doing this. He's doing this through us, and we have to also do our part through him, through his spirit. But I think what you can see is the only reason that we have a part in any of this is because what the Lord has done for us. Okay? Let's start there. What he wants us to remember is not so much what we do, but what he has done. He, and He alone, set us free from bondage. The days of unleavened bread are about leaving bondage and about overcoming in your life. Think about that analogy of Israel coming out of Egypt. How much did the Israelites have to overcome in order to be free? What was the extent of their participation? They needed to believe God through Moses and then follow along, right? That's pretty much it. Prepare the lamb, keep the Passover, stay in their homes overnight, gather at Ramsey's the next day, and then walk out when the signal was given to march. How much overcoming is that? Not very much, is it? Following a few simple instructions. Paul said, by grace you are saved and not by works. It wasn't by their works. When they left Egypt, 
Did they leave sin? Did they leave sin entirely? No, they did not. What they left was the place of their bondage, representing the lifestyle of bondage to sin. And you and I are no longer bound to that lifestyle of sin. We may still struggle, but by His power, we can be overcoming. Remember this day when you came out of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. That's what they came out from, bondage. The place of their bondage. And that's an analogy for this person's, a person's spiritual conversion, especially the earliest stages of their conversion. They are released from their bondage, and they start to come out. Now they still have battles to fight along the way, as we'll see. Verse 5. And it shall be when the Lord shall bring you into the land of the Canaanites, the Hittites, the Amorites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites, which he swore to your fathers to give you a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall keep this service in this month. Bringing you out of state of bondage, but there's still going to be struggles and battles along the way. But he expects us to be overcoming. He didn't take us out to die in the desert, as some of the Israelites lamented at one point, right? He says, seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and in the seventh day shall be a feast unto the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten seven days, and there shall be no leavened bread be seen with thee, neither shall there be leaven seen with you in all your quarters. Now, I know there's some uh, folks who just hide it in their garage then. Say it's not seen with me. Well, you, some, they do the same thing with sin. You may be hiding sin in your garage and think that you're okay and you're not. Get it out. Put it out. That's what this feast is teaching us as well. And you shall show your son in that day, saying, this is done because what the Lord had done. Well, let me turn the slide and go with it. Saying, this is done because that of which the Lord did. Again, that's it's what the Lord did to start with. Unto me. Personalize it. Just like God was personalizing it. And he's very personal. We need to take it very personal. What he did unto me when I came forth out of Egypt. Tell your personal story. Tell your personal testimony. I think it's very strong and it's very powerful. And this is, I mean, the Lord telling us this is what you should do. Tell your children this. And it shall be a sign for you upon your hand and a memorial between your eyes that the Lord's law may be in your mouth. For with a strong hand has the Lord brought you out of Egypt. Unleavened bread is to serve as a reminder to us of what he has done to bring us out. And this is especially true of today, the first day of unleavened bread, because by that time, in our conversion, we have not yet overcome anything to speak of at the beginning. This is when he first bringing them out. <coughs> but as I said, it's very personal. And you can read it in the words if you're looking for it carefully. They had to hurry out. They couldn't wait for their leavened bread to rise. They had to leave with it unleavened. As we should move with a quickness when God calls. And we usually do. For all of us who have, who have been converted and have been baptized, you know that you quickly moved from sin. A lot of it may have been outer stuff, right? Maybe the way you dressed or you know, other things like that, the way you spoke. But God was working from the inside out in those things. And that's what he continues to do. He wants us to quickly follow him. Eleven bread does picture coming out of the world and leaving the bondage of sin. Israel came out of bondage to Egypt. Eating unleavened bread first pictures what God has done and then us submitting to his lead and following him. If the first lump is, un is holy, then the rest of the lump is holy. Our part in following him is obedience. Okay? You're saved. Now this is how you should conduct yourself being in that condition. Sin is failing to comply with God's law. 1 John 3, 4, Whosoever is committing sin is transgressing also the law. For, the sin, for sin is the transgression of the law. I'm going to reiterate, as I did on Sabbath, that a lot of folks will just say, well, this, this, I keep the Sabbath day, therefore I am keeping the law. That person doesn't, so they're not. Yet, 
I'm angry, grouchy, cheat on my taxes, and that's all okay. I still consider myself in compliance with keeping the law of God. But that other person who does all those things, they pay their taxes, they don't cheat their neighbor, they take care of the poor, and yet they don't observe uh, clean or unclean or something like that. I consider them, I'm, I'm holier than them, right? Is that a right perception? Am I taking the whole of the God's law and applying it to myself or not? I'm not. I'm taking part of it, but I'm going to apply all of it to them. That's unjust weights and measures. That's why we got to judge first ourselves, right? Take the logs out of our own eyes before we judge someone else. But I, and I always like to say that with our church genre because we like to emphasize how we're different than other church groups. So we end up on things like Sabbath and Holy Days and Clean and Unclean, and those are good things to do and follow. But, like I said, the unbelieving Pharisees did those things, even tithed on small herbs, and yet Christ called them sons of hell. Okay? So that is not a litmus test for who is his. It's not. As much as maybe we have been taught that over the years. It's not. Fruit of the Spirit is, right? That's the fruit you bear. And it's not your fruit. It's fruit from the Spirit. But sin is failing to do with God's law. And God's law is more than just a Sabbath day. That's what I'm saying. It's how you treat one another. The end of the commandment, the goal of the commandment is love. Out of a pure heart. That doesn't wipe away everything else. But it has, you have to understand that it's for all of it. And doing some of the outward things is just the starting point of coming out of sin. That's the easy stuff. Exactly, Tim. So breaking God's law is one way to, to, to sin. Another way is failing to do what's taught. James 4.17 says, Therefore to him that is knowing to do good and does not do it, to him it is a sin. Anything that's out of faith is sin. There's going beyond what God teaches. And that could be sinful, because you can cause people to stumble. 2 John 1, 9-11 says, Whosoever is transgressing and abiding not in the doctrine of Christ has not God. He that is abiding in the doctrine of Christ, he has both the Father and the Son. If there come any unto you and bring not this doctrine, receive him not into your house, neither bid him God speed. For he that is bidding him God speed is partaker of his evil deeds. So we see one can sin either by commission, omission, or both. A mixture of both. Bro mission? That's submission to a brother, and that's good. So in the Greek, I don't want to spend too much time on the word study stuff, but it's good to touch on it. Hamartia is a sin, right? comes from hamartano, and it means a literally a missing of the mark. But I think lots of people will minimize sin with that explanation. Oh, I just missed the mark. That sounds different than, hey, I've committed a grievous transgression of God's law the most holy being in the universe, and I, I transgressed him, and I can't clean it. Right? There's a big difference between that wording. But they're both true. Daniel 9.11 says, Yea, all Israel has transgressed thy law, even by departing, that they may not obey thy voice. Therefore the curse is poured upon us, and the oath that is written in the law of Moses and the servant of God because we have sinned against him. When we miss the mark, we are sinning against him. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God, Romans 3.23. And then Romans 5.12, Wherefore, as by one man sin entered into the world and death by sin, so death has passed upon all men, for all have sinned. Realize that is a past sent, a tense sentence. It doesn't say you have to continue in sin. As a matter of fact, we're told not to continue in sin, right? Your Bible doesn't lie to you. You've got to decide what voice you're going to obey. The other one in your head or the one that's in the Scriptures, right? See, sin is pleasure for the sinner. However, it's a temporary sin. 
Hebrews 11 teaches us in verse 24 and 25, By faith Moses, when he was come to years, refused to be called the son of Pharaoh's daughter, choosing rather to suffer affliction with the people of God. He could have enjoyed what Egypt had to offer, but he chose not to. And Job 20 verse 5 tells us the triumphing of the, of the wicked is short, but the joy of the hypocrite for a, but for a moment. There is pleasure in sin, but it's only because you're short-sighted. And you could develop... There's certain things that I've eaten that I didn't like at first, but over time you develop a taste for them, right? Not pickles, Ron? <laughs> if you ate them more often, maybe you would. Right? I can think of a few items. I'm sure you can think of a few items too, right? Kale, I still don't care for that, but, you know, what? But my, the, the point is, if you enjoy the taste of the Lord and his holiness, that's what you'll be going after. You're going to go, mm, I want that unleavened bread. But if you enjoy the taste of sin, you're going to say, I want this leavened bread, Right? You not only put away the un, or the leavened bread, but you have to bust out the unleavened bread and eat that, right? It's just like uh, when uh, the demons leave a person and, and the house is swept clean. If you don't fill it, then it comes back with seven spirits more wicked than the first, right? So fill it with the Holy Spirit. Put off, put on principle that we talk about all the time. Put off lying, you know, and put on the truth, right? That type of stuff. So we got to understand that God cannot abide sin. He hasn't changed. Sin will not stand in his presence in the end. That's why he wipes away sin at the end, right? Jesus Christ conquers all things, puts all things under his feet, and then the Father comes, right? Isaiah 59, 1 and 2 says, Behold, the Lord's hand is not shortened that it cannot save, neither is ear heavy that he cannot hear. But your iniquities have separated between you and your God, and your sins have hid his face from you that he will not hear. And he's talking to his people here, not other people. So don't misconstrue and say, well, he won't, he'll hear me, but he won't hear them because they're Baptist or whatever. It's your sin that separates you from God. That's always been true. And he gave us the only and perfect way to put away that sin. That Passover lamb, Jesus Christ. And it's through that that we are no longer separated. He's reconciled us to the Father, filled us with the Spirit. So if, as Tim pointed out, if we walk in the Spirit, we will not fulfill the lust of the flesh, which means you're not sinning as you're following the Spirit. Habakkuk 1.13, Thou art of purer eyes than to behold evil, and you canst look on iniquity. Wherefore, lookst thou upon them that deal treacherously and holdest thy tongue when the wicked devours the man that is more righteous than he? You can't even let, stand in iniquity, but why do you let this happen, Lord, is what he's saying. Okay. Let me add some verses here for your notes. First John, first chapter five and six. Then this is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you. God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. So if I just gave you that scripture, can you justify going on sinning and still call yourself his? Let me read it again. This is the message we've heard from him and declare unto you that God is light. In him is no darkness at all. If we say we have fellowship with him and yet we walk in darkness, we lie and we do not the truth. So what we have to change is our mentality from thinking sin's okay. It's not okay. He's taught it's not okay from the beginning. The days of unleavened bread teach us the same thing. It's not okay. Do not be complacent with it. Get up and run away from it like Joseph from Potiphar's wife. Get up and run. Flee fornication. Get up and run. And then don't stop. 
Keep pressing on. Stop being seeking that leavened bread and seek the unleavened. Develop a taste for that, and you will see that it is far, far sweeter than the leavened bread. Well, uh, that's a good point. So Brian is pointing out that you don't just go, he doesn't expect me to get rid of all the leaven during this feast. I can keep these breadsticks. It's just a small thing, right? You wouldn't do that. And yet we reason in our minds because of our behavior that, well, since I sin and yet I'm his, I, it must be okay and this is always the way it's going to be. But that's against what the Word is telling us. And we've got to stop believing the lie of Satan whispering in our ear, surely you won't die. Because surely you will if you continue in sin. And, surely you're still a slave to Pharaoh. And, and you're a slave to Pharaoh. You weren't freed then. God's, God must be lying to you. Right? That's what Satan says. That's not the message of God. That's the message of the wicked one. And yet, I see it in God's churches everywhere. In many denominations, that they end up teaching one way or another that same thing. Sin's okay. You're going to do it till you die anyway. Paul had a hard time with it. Well, come on over, sit with me. I'll explain Romans 6, 7, and 8 to you anytime. Because the view you have it to justify your sin is wrong. Any view you have that justify your sin is wrong. We're to be holy people. And we can be holy people. I'm kind of off track of what, without my note, but I'm just, I'll just let the Holy Spirit let, let the Spirit ride this here. All right, here's a couple more verses for you. Ezekiel 18, verse 4, Behold, all souls are mine, as the soul of the Father, also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that is sinning, it shall die. Not the soul that is sinning, but claims that their mind will live. doesn't say that. The soul that is sinning will die. Okay, now we all die. Right? Physical death. John 8, 24. Christ said, there, I, therefore, I said therefore unto you that you shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, you shall die in your sins. And we know believing in him doesn't mean just saying, oh yeah, I, I realize he existed or I believe in him. It's also you know, doing what he said. Why do you call me Lord, Lord and not do what I say? And we know his example. He was sinless. That's the example we're supposed to have. He gave us his spirit. He says, I dwell with you. If, he, if, you're, if he's dwelling with you and you sin, you're making him party to that. Well, he's not going to be party to that. But he'll leave you to your own if that's what you're doing. But he'll be shouting in your ear. That, that voice will be shouting, don't go that way. Don't do it. Stop it. But the more you shove that voice away, the, le the quieter it gets, and you won't hear it anymore. And then your conscience will be all okay, and you'll think, well, it doesn't bother my conscience, so I'm okay. Wrong. It's because you seared your conscience. There's a difference. God gave you that conscience for a reason. You didn't listen to it. You didn't use it. Use it or lose it. You got hardened. You got seared, and now you're going to go on continuing that sin. This is going way different than what I, I got planned, but that, that's all right. So, <laughs> Let me go here. Second Peter chapter two, starting in verse eighteen, and we're going to take it through twenty-two. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, puffing you up, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escaped from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. For of whom a man is overcome, of the same he is brought into bondage. For if after they have escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, they are again entangled therein and overcome the latter and is worse with them than the beginning. For it had been better for them to not have known the way of righteousness than after they have known it to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it has happened unto them according to the true proverb, the dog is to its own vomit again and the sow that was washed to her wallowing in the mire. Passover pictures the first major step in God's plan of salvation, justification through the forgiveness of sin 
by faith in the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. The days of unleavened bread explain and memorialize the second major step in salvation, which is our sanctification, becoming holy. Sanctification, saint, saint, becoming holy. When God sanctifies us, he separates us for holy use. That's what he's done with you. If you have been baptized, he has separated you. If you haven't been yet, he's calling you and asking you to come, right? He separates us for holy use. After cleansing us at Passover, he sets us apart and he considers us to be holy. Jesus said, you are clean. The problem is, our human nature remains intact and it resists holiness. That's the fight between the flesh and the spirit. But the flesh is not your master anymore, right? Sin is not your master anymore. When the Israelites passed through the Red Sea, that was a type of baptism. They were symbolically washed and sanctified as a holy people to God. However, they began to murmur and rebel almost immediately. Why? Because they still had their slave mentality. They were not yet accustomed to providing for themselves or believing in the Lord's voice. They were frightened, they were intimidated, and they voiced their desire to return to their bondage in Egypt. And that's what your flesh is doing to go come to come back to sin, right? Oh, let's go back. That that's easier. Or maybe you're thinking you can have one foot in Egypt and one foot in Canaan. You can't. There's a vast gap between those. So we find it very easy at times, and that should bother us, to return to old sinful habits or erroneous ways of thinking. God commands us to keep the days of unleavened bread yearly to remind us to continue to fight free of the bondage, not belonging to Satan's world, not belonging to our own carnality, so we can truly escape slavery with his high hand leading us. He does the work. Again, we just have to be obedient and follow. Proverbs 5, 22, 23, His own iniquities shall take the wicked himself, and he shall be holden with the cords of his sins. That's his bondage. He shall die without instruction, and the greatness of his folly he shall go astray. There are many who have been deceived into thinking that God's word does not apply to them. It doesn't apply to their situation or that there's a better way than God's way. There's not. The result of believing that lie ends up with them in bondage, in prison, in the chains of sin. But if, if and when they cry out to God, He's there, He's listening. He hears. And He brings them out into the light, breaking their chains, opening the prison doors, setting the captives free. It's worth a hallelujah. hallelujah. There you go. <laughs> They're instructed to give thanks to the Lord for his steadfast love. God's word is a lamp to our feet and a light to our path. We'll never be led to sin if we follow that path, will we? Don't step off into darkness because you're following the, the lamp. His word reveals his ways to us. His word teaches us his ways. His word gives us faith, Romans 10, 17. Faith comes by hearing, hearing by the word of God. The question is this. Are we willing to receive his word? Do we, are we willing to sit still long enough to hear his word in our lives each day? I don't mean just while I'm preaching. Okay. In your, in your life each day, are you willing to receive his word? When you cry out to the Lord in bondage, do you cry out? Do you, do you still think, do you think you're free, right? The, think about the dog who's got the uh, chain on his neck and he's that way for a year. Eventually he realized, hey, if I go this far, I choke myself. So he stops going past there. Owner takes the chain off his neck. He still thinks he can't go past there. He still thinks he's chained up. Right, So you can never go out into to freedom. I think sometimes that's the way we are with, with sin. Maybe we're comfortable in it. That's not good. When we cry out to him, 
He'll set us free. His truth, the Word, sets us free if we believe it, what it tells us. It does not tell you you should remain in bondage to sin. I don't know any Christian who would believe that. Oh, and, and no, it doesn't. It says we're free. But then they'll turn around and say, oh, yeah, but I'll always sin. So you're not a Christian then, is what I would like to say. I don't, because that would be mean. <laughs> but I'm, I, I do want to tell them, and you know I will, about the truth about sin. Sin's not your friend. John 8, 31, 32, Jesus said to those Jews which believed on him, if you continue in my word, then you are my disciples indeed. And you'll know the truth, and the truth shall make you free. Did Jesus ever say, show me some red letters, where he said it was okay to keep sinning? No? Nobody? Nobody going to take that one up? Because he didn't say it. Good, good, good class, right? He didn't say it. If you continue in his word, then the truth makes you free. Free from what? Sin. Free from that, all that sin comprised, all that lifestyle. And that burden is lifted, and his burden is light. You're forgiven, go and sin a little less. Yeah, uh, that's not it, that what he said, right. But good point, good point. Continuing, he says, they answered him, we be Abraham's seed, and we were never in bondage to any man. How do you say then we will be made free? Obviously, they didn't know their own history, but... Jesus answered them and said, Verily, verily, or truly, truly, I say unto you, whosoever is committing sin is my servant. No, is the servant of sin. And the servant doesn't get to abide in the house forever. But the son abides forever. If the son therefore shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. Wow. What a powerful passage he just gave them. And us. Whoever is committing sin is the servant of sin. I'm not asking you this right now, okay? I'm asking you to answer. Who has sinned in the past month? Okay, don't, don't raise your hand. You don't have to. Are you serving sin? Are you serving sin? Is it something that was a one-off, or is it something you return to? An empty well you return to all the time whenever you're hurting, stressed out, or whatever. If you're returning to it and it's not a one-off, you're serving sin. If it's a one-off, it's still serving sin that you need to repent of. Because sin is not okay. It needs to be put out completely. You don't have that bag of hamburger buns hiding in your cabinet during unleavened bread. <laughs> Right? I know I preach a lot about it because to me it's the core of everything. If you don't get this, you're in trouble. You're in trouble. You're going to walk in darkness and you're going to stumble. They didn't understand. They were slaves. They didn't get that they were slaves and they needed to be set free. Right? The people Jesus is talking to? We were never in bondage to any man. He told them straight up, uh, whoever commits sin is the servant of sin. That's what I'm talking about. Now do you get it? <laughs> and I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out that if whatever sin you commit, if you are willing to bow the knee and repent, you will be forgiven of him. He is quick to forgive. Even if it's been a long time, maybe you've been a hypocrite in God's church for a long time. It's okay to bow the knee, repent, and know that you're forgiven. Don't pull the, which is prideful and sinful and selfish, to say, oh, boy, he'll never forgive me, poor me. Really? God's hand's too short to save. Right? Don't go there. Don't, and I say this for your own admonition. He does love us, and he wants all men to be saved. They won't be, but he is so willing. And when a heart turns to him, he doesn't forsake it. 
So I wanted to point that out. So we talked about Romans 6. Let's go there. Romans 6, pick it up in verse 4. Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we should walk just like we used to, except use Christian words. No, it doesn't say that. We should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall also be in the likeness of his resurrection. Knowing this, that our old man is crucified, dead with him, that the body of sin might occasionally come out? No, be destroyed. And henceforth, we should not serve sin. For he that's dead is freed from sin. For those baptized members, are you dead with Christ, buried in baptism? So are you chained to sin any longer? Does sin have any hold on you? Unless you willfully let it. Amen. That's what the Word says. Amen. Now, if we be dead with Christ, we believe that we shall also live with Him. Hallelujah. Knowing that Christ being raised from the dead is dying no more, death has no more dominion over him. For in that he died, he died unto sin once. But in that he liveth, he liveth unto God not forever. Likewise, reckon you yourselves also to be dead indeed unto sin, but alive unto God through Jesus Christ our Lord. How did Jesus live his life dead to sin? How did he live his life dead to sin? He didn't commit sin. He didn't transgress the, the law of God in the letter or in the spirit. That's a tall order, isn't it? I can't do it. I can't do it either. But I can do all things through Christ that strengthens me, can't I? I am the temple of the living God. If God be for me, who or what could be against me? That's the message. That's the truth of the Bible. Let's go to verse 15. What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law? But under grace? Right? That means do not eat. God forbid in the Greek means don't even conceive of the thought in your mind. Not for a sec. Right? Don't. Know you not that to whom you yield yourselves, servants to obey, his servants you are to whom you obey whether of sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But God be thanked that you were, past tense, the servants of sin, but you have obeyed from the heart that form of doctrine which was delivered to you. Being then made free from sin, not free to sin, you became the servants of righteousness. So as you used to be a servant to sin, now you are a servant to righteousness, a much less harsh taskmaster. Okay? I speak after the manner of men because of the infirmity of your flesh. For as you have yielded your members servants to uncleanness and iniquity to unto iniquity, even so now yield your members, your body, as servants unto righteousness, unto holiness. Tall order, but you can do it through Christ. For when you were, again, past tense, the servants of sin, you were free from righteousness. That's no more, right? What fruit had you in those things whereof now you are ashamed? You repent and you were ashamed of them, but now you think it's okay to keep doing them? What kind of logic is that? That's devil logic. Get that stuff out of your head. I know that you've been taught it. You've been taught by people who are walking in sin themselves, so they want to take Paul's words and twist them under their own destruction, just like Peter said they would. That's the error of the wicked, the lawless, the anomia. According to Peter, according to the Word. Again, the Word lights our path. For the end of those things is death. But now, now, not later, when Christ comes and returns and you're on the sea of glass with Him, now, being made free from sin and become servants to God, you have your fruit to holiness. And then in the end, everlasting life. Does that make sense? You believe that? I believe that. Let's live our lives like we believe that. For the wages of sin is death, 
But the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Yeah. Let's trip into 7 just for a verse here. Romans 7, verse 6, But now we are delivered from the law, that being dead wherein we were held, that we should serve in newness of spirit and not in the oldness of the letter. So we know in Romans 7, 22, 25, Paul also said, I delight in the law of God after the inward man. But he said, I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity of the law of sin. So he was talking about that struggle between flesh and the spirit. But what we and here's what you need to remember. Anytime you're reading Romans six, seven, and eight, Romans six, he's talking as the as the converted man who this is the way we should live. Romans seven, he talks about when he was kind of unconverted, and he's the carnal man. And then as he trans uh, goes down into eight, he's again talks about being the, the new man. So a lot of people go and count on seven and say, well, look, why do I do what I do? You know, look, I still sin. And they'll use that as their their base for their life. That's the carnal man that he's talking about there. This is this is exactly I believe this is exactly what the verse that Peter was talking about when he talked about uh, uh, Paul being misunderstood and people twisting it to their destruction. And if this is the only passage that you would go to to make you think it's okay to sin and you can't find that anywhere else in the Bible that you can sin, I think you should change that thinking. Stinking thinking. That's bad thinking. Okay. He says. Uh, that who can deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord. Right? So, and then he, the, again, in 7, he says, I serve with my mind the law of God, but with the, with the flesh the law of sin. He's talking about the struggle, but then he's talking about how you get free. His main point in that is, I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, and then all the 6, right? And 8 that you've been set free from sin. He's not double-talking. He's not a hypocrite. A double-minded man, if he's double-talking, a double-minded man's unstable in all his ways and we shouldn't listen to him at all. He's not double-minded. He's exactly what Peter said. He's hard to be understood in some things that he said. But if you have the, the mind of God and realize the truth is the same from the beginning, <laughs> sin is not okay, and you don't believe Satan, oh, surely you won't die. You're okay. You'll be good because you'll be understanding the scriptures as they were laid out. Anybody that tells you it's okay to sin and minimizes your sin, they're lying to you. You can be forgiven completely of sin, and then that could be lifted off of you completely, but there's only one way, and you know the way. Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. Way, the truth, and the life. Truth, and the life. And the light. So the opposite of sin, missing the mark, is to hit the mark, right? That's a positive thought and a worthwhile goal, right? John uh, 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. Romans 22, 14, blessed are they that do his commandments, that they may have the right to the tree of life and enter in through the gates of the city. Now, don't again, don't go and say, well, I keep the Sabbath and this and that, so that's talking about me. But then yet it's okay to hate my brother, not have faith, not have love for everybody. Be careful that you don't use the unjust weights and measures. We can strive to hit the mark. What God, what God is picturing Israel doing by eating unleavened bread describes in action what righteousness is. What is righteousness? We're doing acts of righteousness whenever we follow God and do what he says. That's what righteousness is. It's so simple. When we follow God, when we do things as God would have us do, that is what righteousness is. All his commands are righteousness. Here's a hard one for you guys. And I know it's hard. This is hard for me. Whosoever is abiding in him is sinning not. Ooh, let's skip past this and read something else that sounds lovey-dovey. <laughs> Whosoever is sinning has not seen him, neither known him. Little children, let no man deceive you. He that is doing righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. And you can't say, well, I did these righteous things, and that makes up for these other things I'm doing. We know that doesn't work. The emphasis here 
that is important to this is that eating unleavened bread is is not about coming out of something, but it's doing something. That's right, right? It's the put on put uh, put off put on principle. It really is. The major difference between Jesus and the Pharisees, that unbelieving Pharisees, there were believing Pharisees. I always don't you don't want to paint them always as the bad guys, right? I mean, there was believing Pharisees. The unbelieving Pharisees sought righteousness by avoiding sin. Jesus didn't sin because he went about doing good. He was a man who went about doing good, the scriptures say, right? You see the difference? A contrast between the positive and negative approaches. That's the issue. So when the command says, you shall eat it seven days, do you realize what that means? Again, seven being the biblical number that they say is tied to completion. That's not in your Bible, but you can say see that. I mean, because it completes the week. I think that's why people go there. In practical application, what God is saying is that we're to follow after righteousness all the days of our life. That's what you're supposed to be doing. All the days of your life, eat unleavened bread in that sense. Not just earn unleavened bread. Always remember that the days of unleavened bread memorialize what God did to free us from our bondage. That's our starting point. Eating unleavened bread symbolizes what Israel did following God's lead out of Egypt. That's what righteousness is. Okay. I have on my notes here Philippians 4 8. Whatever things are true, whatever so things are honest, whatever things are just. Whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are a good report, if there's any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. Oh, but that doesn't pass around the Internet well. Right? These are the, those are the things. Philippians 4.8. Uh, I always keep that in my mind. You should always keep that in your mind and heart because that's the things we're supposed to think about. You find yourself thinking about other stuff, conspiracy theories, everything else. That's poison to your soul, man. Think of these good things. Be unleavened bread. Be that sweet bread and matzo bread. And trust God. God's going to sort this stuff out. So, again, the difference between Jesus and the unbelieving Pharisees is the Pharisees looked at the thou shalt not. says just that. It's a negative command. Don't you do that. Whereas Jesus looked at it as I shall not have to do that. I, that's why I look at the Sabbath. It's, it's not, oh, I can't work. Uh Ah, I don't have to work. This is great, man. My, what a day of rest, a day to spend with my father and my brethren. This is great. That's the difference between Jesus and the Pharisees, the unbelieving Pharisees. You get what I mean when I say <laughs> Do's and don'ts. This is a list of, yeah. I don't have to do that anymore. I'm set free. I shall honor my father and my mother because I'm set free. And I have the love of Christ in me now. Don't put the cart before the horse. 1 John 3, 8 and 9. He that is committing sin is of the devil. Whoa, stop right there. Remember what we talked about when I said don't raise your hand and I asked the question if you sinned? All right. He that is committing sin is of the devil, for the devil is sinning from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whosoever is born of God or begotten of God, has his spirit, does not commit sin. Why? Because his seed is remaining in him, and he cannot sin because he's born of God. That's the true instruction to us. But we've fallen for the lie that it's okay and you'll always do it, so you end up keep doing it because you think it's okay in the back of your mind. Well, I have to fight just a little bit and then it's okay. And then I say the prayer, I repent, and then I'm good. And I do it again. Stop that cycle. Stop going back to Egypt. Stop going back to bondage. That is not what he's teaching you. But he knows our frame. That's why we end up having to teach this every year and through the cycles of the feasts. He has compassion on us. When we follow God and we do things as God would have us do, that's what righteousness is. If one does righteousness, if you seek to do righteousness, you won't sin. If you just struggle against sin and don't fill it with His righteousness, 
the fruit of the Spirit, letting it bloom and blossom and grow fruit in you to maturity, you're going to go back to that well all the time. Nurture the Spirit within you. There's, he, Christ said, it, how much more will the Father give the Spirit to them who ask for it? It's an ask away. He's given us everything we need for godliness. Everything. He's provided it. He's started us. He's the author and finisher of our faith. We have to believe in him and trust him. That's where it comes in. That's where your strength is. It's not in you. It's not in your ability to do. It's you the ability to do. You have to believe it. Because if you believe it, then you'll do it. You know, the story of the guy on the tightrope uh, across Niagara Falls. He would wheel a wheelbarrow. This is a true story, too. He would wheel a wheelbarrow of sand on the wire across the falls. 200 pounds of sand. He'd wheel it across. And people cheering and everything. And he says, how many of you think a man, I can wheel a man across the falls? Right? The guy in front's like, yeah, yeah. He goes, okay, get in. The guy's like, oh, no, no. He didn't really believe. Because if he really believed, he would have got in it. Right? And that's what we do. A lot of us say we believe, but then we're not committing ourselves to him, trusting ourselves to that one so he can wheel us through our Niagara Falls, if you will. Okay? <laughs> so this is, this is, these are some scary scriptures, unless you look at it again with the fullness of the light of God's word. Are they condemnatory? They can be. But they also have the truth of the word is that he's ready to turn and forgive us. He's always been. I think Josh sang a song about, you know, turn, return, return to me, right? That's all he's, he's, he's always there all day long. I've held up my arms to this gainsaying people, right? And they refuse to come to me. They want to continue doing what they're doing. But whenever one turns to him, he is there ready to receive him. So if you're a prodigal son or daughter, return. The father will run to you, throw his arms around you, kiss your neck, put a ring on your finger, a robe around you, and welcome you into your home. Okay? And then I'll finish this thought, uh, verse 10. In this the children of God are manifest and the children of the devil. Whosoever is doing not righteousness is not of God, neither he that is loving not his brother. And we can play games, word games with that too, loving my brother. Who's my brother, Lord? Right? I, have you heard people do that? I've heard people in church settings do that. Who's my neighbor? I, I don't have to love them. Maybe they'll even believe some really strange stuff like see the Satan doctrine or something. Any excuse to continue in sin. I want to justify my hatred for that person, right? So I'm going to believe this doctrine because it fits with my feeling. Be careful. But put righteousness first. Realize that's what you're created for. You're created for righteousness. You're created to show, as Christ did to the world, what righteousness is. And I'm not talking about you know, fishes and loaves. He only did that a couple times, guys. But what he did was he lived a sinless life. And he went around telling people, repent, the kingdom's coming. That's what our lives should do. If you live a holy life, people will notice. And they're going to be looking for stuff wrong. And if they accuse you of something, let it be something false. Right? That, that's to God's glory. Here, there's the Feast of Unleavened Bread for you right there. My little children, these things I write unto you, that you sin not. You know I always do that, right? Period. Stop. Stop. Everybody wants to read past that because they want to get right to Jesus' forgiveness. And I understand. Because you're in the desert, you want that drink of living water. But stop while you're in that desert and realize what he's asking us to do. Don't sin, guys. That's what I'm saying, right? I, this isn't me. This is the Spirit of God in the Word of God, which cannot lie, telling you. So if you have a disagreement with this, not with me, believe me, it's because everything on the screen is Scripture. 
And it's not twisted. It's line upon line over and over and over and over again from front to back. Sin's not okay. But now what you get here and you go, okay, I know I'm not supposed to sin anymore. Now, there's the rest of your verse. There's the rest of your man verse. Notice it says, if any man sin, not when, because you're not supposed to be sinning. Don't take that as a licensed sin. That's called licentiousness. The Bible warns against that too. If any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. Oh, amen. Thank you, God. He is the propitiation for our sins, and not only for ours, only for the sins of the whole world, if they turn to him. Don't turn that into universal salvation either, because now, again, you're putting the cart before the horse. You're not reading the whole Bible. You're not using equal just measurements. Let's keep reading here. Chapter 2. And hereby we do know that we know him if we keep his commandments. He that is saying, I know him, and is keeping not his commandments is a liar, and the truth is not in him. So think in your mind of whatever sin you just confess to and say, does that break his commandments? That, you know, of course it does. That's why it's a sin. Yes. Okay, so now you got in your mind that when you're doing this, you're lying about it unless you're confessing it. And the truth isn't in you. That's serious. But whoso is keeping his word, in him verily is the love of God perfected. And hereby know we that we are in him. He that saith he is abiding in him ought to himself also to walk even as he walked. Not in sandals. In sinlessness. That's what he said from the beginning. My little children, I write to you that you sin not. Jesus said the same thing. Come and say and repent. And repent of what? Sin. The message from the beginning is don't sin. Do what I say and you'll be okay. Do what you want to do and you're going to be facing the consequences of those actions. And he minces no words on telling us what that all is. But I, again, I don't want this to be a doom message because you are the saints of God. You have his Holy Spirit. You are the temple of God and you are that dwelling place. And he empowers you that you can keep his law. He empowers you that you can truly fulfill the law through the love of God, through the fruits of his spirit. 1 John 5, 2 and 3, By this we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. For this is the love of God, that we keep his commandments. And his commandments are not grievous. All his commandments are righteousness. When I talk about put on, this is where it comes from. Ephesians 4, 22 through 24, telling us you put off concerning the former conduct, that word should be conduct there, the old man, which is corrupt according to the deceitful lust. Corrupt. Remember? Leaven, seor, comets, right? Zumos, all corrupts. Put off that corrupt and be renewed in the spirit of your mind and that you put on the new man, the matzo matzo man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Not false holiness, not a facade of holiness, a veneer, a thin layer, a fullness of his holiness because he dwells in you. That's empowering. So we, there's a two-pronged approach here. I'm going to reiterate on what unleavened bread is all about. It reminds us of what God did to make it possible possible for us to have this way of life, of holiness, and it symbolizes us following God and doing righteousness proactively, making that the aim of our life. Do holiness. Not just dodging sin here and there, but doing the right and good thing from the heart. And then sin will begin to disappear. And you'll develop a taste for that sweet matzo, and you won't run back to the leaven. So we're coming out of it. It's a fruit of doing the right thing, not just dodging sin. That's what righteousness is. Following God. Doing things God's way. And if one does this, if you follow the word, 
and you have, can by his spirit, right? Everybody knows that if he tells you to do in his word, and he, he can empower you to do it, right? You won't sin. Walk in the spirit, and you will not fulfill the lust of the flesh. So unleavened bread is an annual concentrated effort for a period of seven days to focus our minds and our attention on God's instructions and righteousness so we can live in harmony with him as he directs our steps and gives light to our lives. Galatians 2, 20 and 21, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ is living in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness came by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. I think many times we realize that in our baptism, we join Christ in the grave and we join him in death. We put to death the old man. But when we're supposed to be raised a new creature, I think lots of times we tend to forget who we are. It's that man in the mirror thing again. And then you revert to that old man at times and you think it's okay. And the more you do it, you start to blend the two out. But Paul tells us the right way. This is the right way. Christ is living in you. Don't make, don't pair his body with the body of a harlot. Right? You are the holy temple of God. How do you treat something that's holy? Right? You can learn from the idol worshipers on that, right? Ooh, don't touch. Look at this. Ooh, ooh. Right? So I told you before the story of your father's favorite cup. Right? You are your father's favorite cup. It's a cup of gold. It's pure. And it should only be used for good things. You don't take your father's cup and use it to bale sewage. It's to be used for good and holy things. There are other vessels to use for those things. And first Peter, we read chapter two, verse twenty four, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree that we, being dead to sins, should live unto righteousness. For by whose stripes you are healed, for you were a sheep going astray, but now are returned to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. I wanted to point out a couple of things here. Again, you're dead to your sins and should live to righteousness. That's why it's underlined both. It's the same message, same story. But I also wanted to point out that you, you can return. No matter where you've been, you can return to the shepherd, the bishop of your souls. He is willing. Don't believe anything else. We can see what happens. We'll believe one thing, and maybe we'll even get some light on it. Go, oh, now I see it's really this. But if we, if we dwell there and convict ourselves of sin, but don't give us ourselves the cure, you're just drinking more poison. You were bad, now you're kind of in a worse condition, and you're not going to get to the great physician to get what you need to heal you. See, all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that you, the man or woman of God, may be perfect, Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. Amen. We're also told flee also youthful lusts, but follow after righteousness and faith and love and peace with them that call on the Lord out of a pure heart. Now, the normal way of finding God's way of doing things is through his word. What's going to be the fruit of that if we do it? What's going to be the fruit? What does John 17, 17 say? It says, sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. His word is truth. All these words, the, almost all of this, about 90% of this has been just straight scripture on the screen. That's all his words. Anything that's not scripture would be my words. All right. So I want to point you to his word, but his word is truth. What's the fruit of following these things? If we obey God's word, if we follow him explicitly, we will be separated from the world. That's what sanctify means. Sanctify them through your truth. Your word is truth. This word should be sanctifying you, setting you apart, making the difference apparent. 
When we're obedient to the pure and uncontaminated Word of God, we become sanctified for God's use. Never sit there and go, oh, God, use me, use me. Yeah, I'm trying to, but you keep putting your sin in the way. Get rid of that, and then I can use you. Now you're a vessel that's cleaned up and ready for my use. Eating unleavened bread every day during the days of unleavened bread is not a burden, would you say? It's not an affliction, although if you just eat little crackers all the time, it might seem like an affliction. But it's supposed to the eating the unleavened bread was supposed to remind us of the affliction that God took us out of. Not to cause you affliction. It's to remind you of the affliction God took you out of. It reminds you what He did for you and what He is doing in you. It's a reminder that following God's way every day of our life is crucial to our being prepared for the kingdom of God. What God is showing us through the analogy of loving and sin, particularly in, during these days of unrest, right. is clear. He wants you and I to escape the clutches of sin and go lead a righteous life. Right? But how can you eliminate sin and grow in righteousness? How? Well, one, recognize sin. I think sometimes we don't recognize sin. Right? Sin is transgression of the law. Discerning Sin is the matter of applying God's law. And we talked about self-examination on Sabbath, right? Examine yourself, as 2 Corinthians 13, 5 tells us, and see how God's law exposes the leaven in your character. If you really examine yourself, you'll see it. Are you really putting God first in everything? Are you humbly submitting to his authority? Can you even admit that you're wrong? Two, we should resist sin. We've already seen through the analogy, leaven, uh, or sin can spread quickly like leaven. So you must resist temptation before it turns into sin. Reference James 1, 13 through 15 for that, right? Lost one is conceived, right? Brings forth sin, sin brings forth death. You must, the Spirit will tell you, it'll tweak you if you're listening. Doing this requires self-control. Hi, hey, that's funny. He gives us the spirit, which has a fruit called self-control, right? So we can do it. Resist the wrong and replace it with the right thoughts put off and put on. Struggling against sin. You have not yet resisted unto blood struggling against sin. Right? Scripture says. In struggling against sin, you may reach a point that you grow battle-weary. And it's times like that you can think that you've done all you can to stand. But don't be fooled. You can do more. As I said, Hebrews 12.4, you have not yet resisted unto blood, striving against sin. That's the expectation. Strive with all your might. Remember the story about the guy pushing on the rock I told a couple weeks back? Right? I've done this all my all, all my years, Lord, and I pushed and I pushed, but you told me I never moved the rock an inch. And he says, I never told you to, to move the rock. I told you to push on it. Well done. Now look at you. you. You're strong. You're able to do it. He goes, now I'll move the rock, right? And that's what God does to us, right? The third thing is we need to repent of any sin. Whenever we see and recognize sin and resist it, if you find yourself falling to it anyways, Repent. It's a short distance between your knees and the floor. Real repentance is abandoning the wrong way and beginning to live the right way. God promises to cleanse us from all unrighteousness, doesn't he? First John, right? Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There will be some who will tell you and me, don't try so hard. Just rely on grace. But what does God say? What shall we say then? Shall we continue it in sin that grace may abound? God forbid. How should we that are dead to sin live any longer in it? Is that simple wording? Is that hard wording to understand? How should we who died with Christ and were dead to sin, how should we live any longer in, in sin? 
That's not hard language. We can't claim that we're ignorant. It's difficult to understand. Will you overcome all your sins at once? Probably not. <coughs> but don't use it as an excuse to continue. But don't dismay about it either. Ask yourself, hey, am I sinning like I used to? Does the sin have control over me? Is it like it used to? Then maybe you're making progress. Give yourself some, some of that momentum that you're leaving Egypt. But don't be content there. You have to reach the promised land. And there's giants there that you have to fight. That's your, that's your final sins that are so big and so ingrained, or maybe that you love so much that you don't want to let them go. Those are the hard ones to fight. But yeah, yeah you don't make a league with them. But you, you do like, yeah, Caleb, give me that mountain, right? I'll take them out. Why? Because the Lord's with me. I mean, always remember this. If you fight your own battles, you will lose. Every time Israel tried, they lost. They had to have the Ark of the Covenant out in front of them. When you have the Ark of the Covenant, the Lord's coming out in front of you, He will fight for you, He says. Again, do we believe the word that we claim we believe? He will fight for us. Believe it. Uh, on the screen, 1 Timothy 6, 11 and 12, But you, O man of God, flee from these things. Instead, follow after righteousness, godliness, faith, love, patience, and meekness. Fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life, whereunto you are also called and have professed a good profession before many witnesses. Jude, <laughs> verse 3. Beloved, when I gave all diligence to write unto you of the common salvation, Jews and Gentiles, it was needful for me to write unto you and exhort you that you should earnestly contend for the faith which was once delivered to the saints. It's something you have to contend with. Again, Jacob, the angel of the Lord appears to him. They wrestle to the break of the morning, right? And he says, what's important, I will not let you go till you bless me. And his name was changed to Israel, which means I have striven with God and prevailed. We are striving with God, with God, not against God. But we're striving against the flesh. Don't let go of God. Don't let go of the Lord until he blesses us in the end. Continue the struggle, fighting the good fight. Earnestly contend for it. Ephesians 5, 15, 16. See then that you walk circumspectly, not as a fool, but as wise, redeeming the time because the days are evil. Hey man, we don't know when we're going to be taken off this planet. Don't you want to hear, well done, good and faithful servant, instead of get away from me, I never knew you? I know I do. I told you about this verse, and so I want to close with this verse again. We're to be anxious for nothing. It says careful there. It means anxious. Don't be anxious. Don't be hyper. I, I, I can't. Oh, right? Don't have, have peace. Is the Lord with you? Is the Lord for you? Are you in a hard place? Yeah. But did he say that he'll forsake you while you walk through the valley of the shadow of death? No. Right? Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication. If you're doing that, that's showing your faith. Have you ever been guilty of this? Well, I guess all we can do now is pray. Really, that's all you can do. Petition the God of the universe who says he's with you and will do what you ask. That's all you have left to do after you've tried all of the stuff. That you Think about it. Faith. It's a fragile thing. I think either, either you have it or, or don't, right? Christ said, as a grain is a mustard seed. A grain of a mustard seed, you can move a mountain. So let's strive, earnestly contend for that faith once delivered. It's about believing Him. Not just believing about Him, believing Him. Believing in Him and the words that He gave us. Okay. Um, With thanksgiving, let your request be known unto God. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, shall keep your hearts and minds through Christ Jesus. Wow! What a blessedness, what a peace is mine, leaning on the everlasting arms. Wow. 
Isn't that a better place to be? Tell you what, if you're walking in sin, you're not going to have that peace. You're going to feel double-minded. You're not going to feel right. You're going to be ashamed. You're going to be worried somebody's going to expose your darkness. But here's what happens. When you stop thinking of the dark things, stop thinking of whatever it is that, that well that you're drawn to. I get satisfaction when I'm angry at so this and, or that, whatever. Stop thinking of those things and rather put on the good things. Think on these things. I, I, I challenge you, really, I, I think that lots of times our thoughts are a lot of the opposite of these things, and that's why our lives are bad. Our lives are good in the Lord. And we would be more joyful, and joy is a fruit of the Spirit as well, we would be more joyful if we would follow after the things of the Lord. Here they are, right? Whatever's true. By word is truth, there's a good place to start. Not questionable, not stuff all over the Internet that anybody could write. Whatever's true, whatever's honest, Man, we always like to think of the dishonest things instead of thinking of the good and the honest. When you meet somebody, you think of the bad things or you, you put your best foot forward with them, right? Whatsoever things are just, justice. Oh, man, we should be crying out for justice in this world. Whatever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of good report, if there's any virtue, if there's any praise, think on these things. That's the matzo. That's the sweet bread. Fill your life with that. These are the things that God wants from us, right? And they're reasonable requests and they're easy requests. Not only easy, they're blessed requests. And the more we walk like he walks, get rid of the leaven in our lives and walk without leaven, intaking the good, the good matzo, Seven days a week, completion, always. You won't turn sour. You won't be a bitter old person at, you know, if, you're, if you're following these things. But I've seen many people grow old in the church and turn bitter or walk away. But if you're following these things, you're following righteousness, you'll be blessed. And that's what I really want you to walk away with. Be blessed. Believe him. Surrender yourself to him. You all just took over the, uh, uh, the Passover again. That's a, what I look at as a renewal of your baptism, that death of the old man and the raising of the new with Christ living in you, right? Rededicate yourself to that thought. If that's the, the thought you lead with, I think you will be more successful in staying abiding to that vine. And that's what he wants from us. That's what he expects from us. He does have mercy. Let's not start there. Let's start because he gave us mercy. Let's start on following that path. He laid it out for us. He's enabled us to do it. He's given you the heart to do it. You want to, right? And that's, oh, that there was a heart in them, they would keep my commandments. Okay, you got the heart. Now you have to follow through. Now you need the guts. Now you need the courage. Get in there and fight those giants. And the Lord's with you, and you will win. I'm confident of it. I know through his grace, when I stand and fight, I win. And it's not me that wins, it's, his, it's he, he that wins. You can do it. And I'll, I'll leave you with that.